Buildy here. Yeah, I'm back at the park. Uh, talk a little about some uh, aggregate issues. This is something I saw in Sevastopol, and I see it here. These places built during the Soviet Union days. Well, they had to save money. On the beach, they had a tendency to use beach sand and beach rocks in their concrete. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't age too good. It looks good for a while, but uh, I don't know how long ago this was done. I'm guessing in the 50s, maybe early 60s, which makes it, you know, 60, 70 years old already. Maximum strength concrete is achieved in about 73 years. Good concrete. Uh, it gets harder for 73 years. And after that, it continues to get hard, but after 73 years, it's a liability. It gets so hard, it starts to spall and come apart, and micro cracks take place, and they become big, big cracks. Modern concrete doesn't last forever like Roman concrete appears to. It doesn't turn back into stone. It, uh, it eats itself. This is what it does. These steps look like they were uh, manufactured in a factory in sections. They might be the steps that they made for the buildings. They look like they are, but look at the difference. Oh man. The difference in height and width of the steps. That's common here though. They might have been defective is why they ended up in a park. You know, they're kind of consistent. Okay, the difference is in when they come together in sections. Okay, these are uh, one section ends and another one starts. See that? <laughs> yeah, that's where they put one on top of another, where they spliced them. So it's uh, workmanship. And obviously, this aggregate is rounded off. Not from the weather here. It's 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 rounded off again. This is these are beach rocks and beach sand. Yeah, if this stuff's 60 years old or 70 years old, I guess it done pretty good. I'm a concrete Nazi. I did a lot of concrete and studied it. And your engineers will tell you you got to use sharp square grain mountain sand and sharp aggregate broken you know crushed stone using beach stone and river sand and river rocks it's not optimal but you know what you don't need optimal it's freaking concrete it's only good if you make the absolute best concrete in the world if you don't use uh roman techniques and roman re recipes in it they don't even know if those will work with the modern cement they put puzzle and stuff puzzle I don't even know how to pronounce it. I don't know how it's spelt though. It's a special kind of volcanic ash. They probably chemically generate something similar and call it puzzle. To make it more replicate the, the Roman concrete because the puzzle or puzzle and there it has certain other chemicals that were in Roman concrete that would actually stop the process of the of the alkaline uh, eating it up from the inside out slowly after it reaches a certain point and instead of that it polymerizes it like rocks are made the same process that rocks are formed in sedimentary rocks or uh, any sort of uh, composite rock like pudding rock they call it that's that's the most blatant example where you have a bunch of stones come together and congeal and make one boulder and it's monolithic even though it's made out of many many parts it's made out of aggregate it becomes one rock and you can cut it or break it and it doesn't break along the lines of the old stones it becomes one concrete is the same thing it becomes one up until 1825 they didn't have modern industrial concrete which is made by cooking to extremely high temperatures certain elements i forget off the top of my head i'm doing this by memory <laughs> and making clinkers and you grind up the clinkers and you got cement and it sticks things together but 
it also starts a process after it gets a certain hardness of eating itself and from the inside out and making micro cracks which just get worse and worse and worse and then it comes apart it turns back into its elements it releases the rocks and sand it starts pulverizing itself roman concrete continued to harden and congeal and egyptian concrete the egyptians made concrete did you know that a lot of the pyramid stuff was concrete not chiseled stone they did quarry blocks and drag them across the desert but they also made blocks and they're indistinguishable from the quarried ones except for tool marks they cast a lot of those blocks in place there's some interesting videos that uh where that's been replicated a certain recipe that uses uh, limestone uh, I don't think they used volcanic ash. They used another recipe. I think there was uh, Nile salts, salt mud, some other sort of thing. It, it had the same effect. Certain clays, they get the right mixture, pulverize it, carry it in baskets up by hand, throw it in wooden forms, moist, pound it into shape, and then pull the forms off and let it harden. It takes several months before it's really hard enough to hold a lot of weight. But then it gets there. And then after several years, or maybe even several decades, it's indistinguishable from natural limestone. That's some pretty powerful stuff, because natural limestone lasts apparently thousands of years. Anyway, we don't have to worry about building houses that last thousands of years. It's nice, though. It's nice to build something your great-great-grandchildren can inherit. I had the ambition I wanted to do that. And it's not that hard. It's just a lot of labor, a lot of work. And you got to have the right materials. Some places the materials are handy. They're right there on your property. cremia has got a lot of limestone back west of here. In the east, not so much. They have very unique stones there. I forget what they're called. They're... I'm going to have to ask about that and explore it. I, I've had it told to me that about the... Uh, Kirch stone. There's a name for it in Russia. I forget it right now because new new information. I got a lot going on. It's hard for me to remember stuff. But uh, and see how I'm doing lightwise. But just a little short one about aggregates and concrete. They're not concrete Nazis here. They're pretty loose loose with it, and it does its job the way they use it. Uh, and dachas is pretty different. It works fine for what you're using. People pour beams. Around here they got seismic activity, so you need to pour some pretty serious beams. You dig your footing. The frost line, I don't think there is one. If there is, it's not very deep. It gets right around freezing. It's about as, as cold as it gets around here, but there's high winds in winter too. Lots of, lots, lots of wind. But you pour your beams and your footings, and then they'll start putting a floor on it. And they mix it by hand. And they use beach sand and beach rock. And if they could afford it, they get better rock, but usually still beach sand. I've seen people use good sand and, and bad rock, <laughs> and bad sand and good rock. Guys I'm working with got some pretty bad sand. It's silty beach sand, but the rock they got is great. They put a little soap in it too, because the soap makes it waterproof. You don't have to seal it. Uh, dish soap, yeah, freaking dish soap. I always knew you put glycerol in, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, fat, synthetic fat or organic fat that's soluble in water. You put that in your concrete, and it makes it watertight. It makes it so water doesn't infiltrate. Because if you're building something and taking years to do it, you don't want water to infiltrate. Water infiltrates it and then freezes. Just surface temperature freezing will spall. It'll start flaking it off. They put dish soap in it so water doesn't infiltrate. Pretty good idea. It doesn't take much. But then they mix it by hand and they pour it. They'll make the forms and they'll pour like a one meter wide strip. But they don't form the inside. They just let it slump with the rebar and, or wire sticking out of it. And then they'll put, uh, they'll, they'll strike it off where it's nice and smooth except for that inside edge. It's just rough. And they'll leave it. They'll, they'll go down as they work. Uh, two people working, you can only do so much, maybe a 10, 12, 13, 15 foot strip. Then the next day they come back and continue it halfway across. And then they'll start on the next strip, but they don't pour that against the old one. They put a board in there and level it, so they got a strike board. They put a board on either side as they pour the ones out in the middle of the form, so they got strike boards. And then they let it slump on both sides. The, the, the next one that's in the middle, or one of the middle ones, 
they let it slump off on both sides with a rebar and uh, or wire sticking out and they strike the middle and they use their strike boards just to do that they're not really forms they just uses uh, level boards and they pour again and again they got all these strips and then they pour between the strips they let it set up they don't make it trim they don't make it square they don't make joints in it they don't use uh what is it uh an adhesion type chemical or anything to pour fresh concrete onto old concrete they don't do any of that they just pour it in the middle they trowel it off and of course it's got you know paper thin new concrete sitting where it feathers into old concrete not very old but it works i see they get done and it looks pretty decent that's not the finished floor though see that's why it doesn't matter they're just ballpark level and they pour it a foot thick a full foot thick they're basically using cheap homemade you know handmade concrete as flowable fill because your real floor goes on top of that after you start building the building once you get the walls going up or you can build the whole building and then go in in the shelter of the building that's usually what they do they get a special kind of concrete that's a little softer and uh, i guess they probably get plasticizers in it or, or something and they make that nice, beautiful, perfectly flat level floor inside on top of the foot thick flowable fill that they just poured. Now, American walks up and sees them pouring that original floor and it's like, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that. Ah, oh, it's stupid. That's going to break. That's not good. It's not optimal. No, it's not going to break. It's not stupid. It's not optimal if you're making a finished floor, but they're not making a fill and finished floor. That's how they do things here. Looks like it's pretty robust. Even when the concrete gets 80 years old, starts disintegrating, eh, it's not going to affect your house. It's not going to start sinking and caving in and falling out. You can always redo the top layer of the floor anyway. Anyway, that's one of the things I've learned working with some guys here. There's a lot of traffic out there. I don't, see, I don't know if you can pick this up or not, but look at all those ships waiting to go into Mariupol. I think that's the way they're heading. Are those materials to rebuild? I need to find out who's doing it and see if I can get on a crew, get me an official job. That'd be pretty bitching. <sighs> as long as we're talking about aggregates and hand-mixed concrete, which you Americans are probably going to have to start doing if the economy collapses. You can't get trucks to come in and deliver your concrete and contractors to do it for you. You homesteaders want to do things yourself. If you want to deal with cement, some things do have to be cement. You can make your own cement too if you got limestone, but more about that later. You can look that up on the web. But uh, you got to have good tools, good equipment. They got these wheelbarrow wheels <laughs> that are bright colors, they're really gaudy. And they, they don't have air in them. They're made of foam. So you don't have to worry about punctures. I've been using one of those. You can't haul much weight on them. If you load them down with a full tub of gravel or sand or even just soil, you can't hardly push it. It's like a flat tire. It doesn't go flat, but it's just got so much friction. The, the composition of these foam tires is awful you're pushing your wheelbarrow and it's real hard to push you're on pavement that's level and you really got to lay into it and you hear that tire going whoa, 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 whoa. it's it's making these squeaky rubber noises loud and you, you run it back and forth a few times and it gets hot so that thing's making a lot of friction it's like having a big sticky flat tire on front it's worse than a flat tire you can't hardly push it because of the chemical design of the tire it's so it's just the right amount of soft and squishy and the tire starts it starts dissolving it starts disintegrating uh it starts flaking off pieces of the tread come off it starts throwing uh strips around the edges you're wasting a lot of work pushing this thing you know what uncle bildy likes now, uncle bildy been around he knows some stuff uncle bildy likes old steel wheel you get an antique wheelbarrow that has a narrow steel wheel. That thing's so easy to push in any environment, even in sand and stuff. You don't need to float on top of the sand, you know, unless it's just bottomless, really deep. A narrow wheel works fine. A large diameter, narrow steel wheel. I'm going to set up a jig and start making some. That might be a business, too. I'll be the wheelwright. 
steel wheels, steel spokes. Easy to make if you got a welder. You could make a, a jig to roll out a flat bar. Doesn't have to be very thick. It's better if it's lighter. And they'll wear, but you could patch them. Or you could put, if you really must, if you're running them on some nice tile or pavers and you don't want it scarring them up, you could cut sections that a tire tread and screw them to it. Countersink the screws, screw and glue. You got hard rubber there, not very thick. It'll make it a little harder to push, but not near as much as this squeaky fat rubber foam crap that they come out with. They got tools that make you work your ass off. Tools should make work easier. I'm old school. I'd build me some steel wheels, large diameter steel wheels. They're, they're, they're useful for a lot of things. You could build them real light and they'll take the torque better than these thin Chineseium 10 two-piece wheels or one-piece wheels that they stamp out in a factory. And then they put the big foam rubber thing on it. It's supposed to be a tire. Then you work your ass off pushing it. You're just making noise and heat. All your effort, 80% of it's going toward making that satisfying and it gets hot. Too much friction. Too much friction going, sir. Just a thought, just a little advice. If you're gonna homestead, you're gonna make concrete. I'll have some more uh, videos about uh, ways to make stuff. I'm gonna build, oh, I need some investors or something, or if I get some enough money coming in, I, I got a design for a concrete mixer that's killer. It's really small. Well, it's bigger than the ones that you buy. Uh, it's got a pretty big compartment for sand, another one for gravel, and another one for cement that are proportional for what you need for your mix. Of course, you need to adjust it if the sand's wet or anything, you gotta adjust your water. But uh, it has a water tank and it's mechanized. It could be air powered or electric powered or even hand powered if you want. An efficient flywheel system and a crank or some pedals. But you really probably need air. Air is best. And you can get air to look at this breeze here. It's beautiful. If you had a big prop running an air compressor and a really big tank, you'd have free air to run it off of. But uh, this system, it'll have to be powered to drive it around. An air motor on one of the wheels, geared really low, don't want to go fast with this when it's loaded. You can chug it up into place. And if you got an elevator, uh, I've designed a tube that everything flows into through metered valves into this mixer and it mixes it as it goes up. You want to go pretty high and then it drops into another tube where it goes down and it's mixed with water on the way down. Just the last sections where it gets the water. So you're mixing it dry and you're making it as needed. You turn the thing on the water goes into it and it mixes and it comes out of the spout. So you shut it off, empty it out, and you just let it sit weeks if you want. You don't have mixed concrete that you have to use right now. You can shut it off anytime and you can direct it to wherever you need it. And it's not really that fast. It's flowing out fairly slow. So you can, if you want to add foam and plasticizers and trowel thick walls up together on the on the on a grid or if you are pouring a slab you just do it very slowly in sections it's not too slow it's faster than doing it by hand just loading the things a couple of people can keep it loaded or a little loader can keep it loaded you have to have a really small bucket though and it could be designed for your own application It'd be compact enough to roll in it in tight places, set up, and put the concrete exactly where you want it, and you make it as you go. Anyway, they already have this stuff in trucks, small trucks, one-man concrete. The same, same logic could be applied to a small uh, home builder or small contractor setup that goes back in tight spaces. And uh, it wouldn't be that difficult to make or that expensive. Just a thought. I've got it all pretty much worked out. I gotta dig up the details or remember them. I got them on my internet files somewhere, or my uh, files on my computer, I hope. But that would be a good one for around here. Look at all those ships. There's a gazillions of them. I don't know if that's coming out or not. I can't see what I'm putting it on. There we go. One, 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Hell, just in that area alone, there's probably 60 of them that I can see. The little ones are tugs. The little ones are tugs. There's probably 60 of them out there that I can see. Interesting. Can't see the bridge. It's in a big cloud of fog right now. I hear a backhoe working down here. They must be working on this retaining wall. I don't know. But probably wouldn't be able to see it. I don't want to walk all the way down there because I'd have to walk all the way back. Anyway, this is just a short one about aggregates and wheelbarrow wheels and tools that work and save work. Now, they really had it right in the old days. They had flywheel, flywheel powered tools and steel wheels and what's well, old fashioned stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a work saver too. Even your hand crank tools, you had big heavy flyweights and flywheels on them. Once you get her going, it's easy to maintain and you can do a lot of work because you got a lot of torque. Now they make things like modern racing bicycle technology. It's all really light and then you got no inertia. It's all power in immediate. It's harder to do. Whether it's for washing clothes, mixing concrete, flywheel power is a lot better. Iron and steel. Or if you just need a lot of raw weight, cement. And air power. That's enough for this one. I'm just gonna start doing some shorts about the technology. And uh, I'll include some links to some things that pertain to it. And uh, gonna be a lot more shorts like this. And I gotta put together a Patreon channel where people can subscribe. to uh, really inexpensive, easy ways to do things to make your home manufacturing, small holding, homestead, farming, all that stuff. Oh, the technology the Amish held on to it. They know what they're doing. Amish got it. They, they know the score. They're not opposed to technology as a lot of people think. My dad was raised by a man from an Amish community. They were Dutch. Uh, when his mother died, he was dropped off at an aunt's and she was a Pentecook and she married a Brenneman and he was Amish, but he didn't live in an Amish community. And he did some things that were un-Amish, but pretty much practiced Amish uh, mentality. He ran for political office, so that's not very Amish. But uh, his way of doing things I understand the Amish. A lot of people don't. I worked in factories in uh, around the Great Lakes, around South Bend, uh, Goshen. There's a big steel plant or uh, automotive stamping plants there in Goshen, Indiana. I lived there a while. Amish guys go in and work in the factories, uh, contract work, fixing uh, machines, rebuilding machinery, welding. They took care of a lot of stuff. They're not against technology. All these boneheads that worked in this factory to laugh at them. Oh, 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 they think that God's got a problem with technology, but they're in here welding stuff. You don't understand them at all. They don't have a problem with technology at all. They have a problem with technology that they don't have control of. They have problems with systems that subject them to outside forces. Yeah, that sounds like they were pretty wise now, doesn't it? Some of their buggies, they get carbon fiber trees. Apparently they learned to make carbon fiber because they wouldn't be buying it from somebody else. There's Amish people making carbon tire, fi carbon fiber trees and carbon fiber wheels for their buggies. Hydraulic brakes, manual hydraulic brakes. Some of those buggies are really light. They're super high tech. They don't have a problem with technology. They have a problem with being dependent upon corporate technology. Amish get it. Anyway, you can live independently, a small community of like-minded people, grow your own food, have your own livestock, build your own houses, 
and live comfortable and real comfortable and you can have some pretty high-tech stuff but you're not gonna have materials that come from clean rooms and huge factories stuff you can do yourself you don't have to have carbon fiber it's just a luxury but you can make anything you need and it's could be heirloom quality stuff that lasts for generations it's not that difficult decentralized manufacturing the only thing that stop you from doing it is the corporations control all the regulatory bodies and you have laws and zoning laws and ordinances and regulations that are designed to keep you from doing that so you have to be dependent on them that's what needs to be undone that's an ideology that's an ideological platform that people can get on board with and start pressuring to control their environment through politics you might not like politics take the black pill and think there's nothing we can do well there is something you can do but you need to organize and get off your butts and quit whining and complaining and start doing something about it you need to organize around an ideology the people have the right to control their own property and to receive the benefits of their own labor that they have the right to challenge parasitic demands on this labor and on these blessings and parasitic systems that seek to regulate them and herd them into something that's profitable for corporations in the name of fairness or in the name of safety or in health yeah right you people are going dirt and vegetables. Well, that's got viruses and you know, dirt has germs in it. We got to stop that. There are people that freaking stupid and they're stupid people that they, they get to go along with them. Well, it's for our safety. Well, we all went through this just recently, didn't we? You need media, you need politics, you need enforcement. Because if they lose in politics, they're just going to hire the goons to come in and try to enforce it anyway. Well, that's why we have a Second Amendment. You have to make it cost them something, then they back off. But you got to go through the procedure, you got to do it right, you got to keep everything legal, and you got to try to avoid that. And you probably can you get enough people on with your ideology. Put together yourself, put together a Bill of Rights everybody can agree on. You know? And they have arguments against us, but you need to be ready, ready for them when they start with these arguments. <laughs> You'll be able to put a pig farm right next to my restaurant. No, you won't. You don't need government to stop that kind of stuff from happening. It didn't happen in the past. If it did, it was a provocation at some ice stage in order to make more government. A lot of this stuff that happened was done by corporations so they could get regulatory control and capture and get laws passed so they can get control of things and make you dependent. Anyway, that's enough for this one. I said it's going to be short now. I just don't know when to stop. Somebody stop me! I'm a Wildy signing out. I'm putting together a Patreon channel and I hope to get a lot of subscriptions. i got to get some income coming in and i got a way to get it here. So, uh, i got to do something. i got to do something because i got to pay for lawyers and stuff but once i got money here it'll be sweet we can have demonstrations of this technology if i got my own place we're going to do some spearmen we're going to build things but that's pie in the sky right now <laughs> one step at a time i'm always thinking ahead yeah, you can always dream it's an incentive it's a motivating factor and sometimes it works uncle Billy signing out bye bye